Hi there. Uh, today we're talking about intimacy direction. My name is Colin Blackard. I am wearing a black t-shirt and a gray blazer. I have a beard, I have glasses, and I also have short brown hair with a receding hairline, which my mother calls distinguished. Um, I am the managing director for Company of Fools, a theater company based in New York City. And though COF is moderating this talk, uh, this would not be possible without TDF. It's a non-for-profit organization dedicated to making theater affordable and accessible to all of us. So welcome TDF fans. And if you're, uh, if you're unfamiliar with TDF, you can learn more by going to www.tdf.org. Again, that is www.tdf.org. Uh, joining our talk today are two supremely talented artists who specialize in intimacy direction. We have Christina Ramos, who goes by Cha. Hi, Christina, how's it going? Going great. And please, Colin, feel free to call me Cha while we're talking today. Totally fine. Thank you. I will do so. And we also have Brooke Haney as well. How's yeah. it going? Great. <laughs> uh, just a little secret. These are not just two amazing performers, but I'm also very lucky to call them friends. And I'm also glad to introduce them today as well. I'm going to start with Cha. Uh, Christina Ramos also goes by Cha. She is a bilingual and bisexual multidisciplinary theater artist. Cha works primarily as a fight and intimacy choreographer and director for stage, but she can also be found in rehearsal rooms as a dramaturg, playwright, and performer. As an intimacy professional, Cha is particularly drawn to Latin stories and queer stories, and she is especially adept at working at the intersection of multiple movement styles, such as intimacy stories, uh, excuse me, intimacy, combat, uh, combat, dance, so much more. Uh, current projects include performing with the Vixens on Guard, intimacy direction for torn out theaters, uh, Cha, please correct me if I'm saying this correctly. Antigonic, please. How do you say that? Antigonic. It's Antigonic. like Antigonic, but Antigonic. Yeah. Ah, gotcha. Very well done. Uh, dramaturgy for new queer adaption of Anna Karina. Um, teaching with Turn to Flesh Productions, an intimacy direction and coordinator, and an ongoing workshops of her original plays, Fire, Burn Them, and Light to the Gods. She has a BA, a bachelor's in anthropology, and a master of fine arts in theater, both from the Columbia University. Uh, Christina, please describe yourself and your location. Please. Sure, sure. Hi, folks. Again, Christina Ramos. I also go by Cha. Um, I am currently sitting in front of some straight curtains that are sort of an orangey and yellow colored striping pattern. Um, I am a white presenting Latine artist wearing a gray t-shirt, a gold chain, and I have short cropped brown hair and brown eyes. And I'm very happy to be here. Uh, not distinguished though, because it's not thinning. You have a great no, it's head of not hair. Not nearly as distinguished as your hair, Colin. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you very much. Also joining us, we have Brooke Haney, uh, a New York City based actor, director, and intimacy choreographer who has worked regionally in the States as well as in Kenya, the Philippines, Germany and Switzerland. Brooke is a queer artist who specializes in BDSM kink and LGBTQIA plus stories. Brooke, is also, uh, Brooke also works as an adjunct professor in Maramont Manhattan College and as a consultant and intimacy director at Vassar College. They have their BA in theater arts from the University of Washington and their MFA in performance from the University of Central Florida. Consent forward rehearsal rooms are at the forefront of their art making practice. And they are very excited to be a part of this conversation. You wrote that so that I'd read it. I appreciate that very much. I'm also very excited to have you here. Brooke, Brooke, please describe yourself and your surroundings for everybody. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Brooke Haney. My pronouns are they and she. Uh, I am a white femme presenting person with long, dark, curly hair. Uh, I'm wearing a kind of burnt orange sleeveless dress on a red chair with a white wall and a little bit of a brown door you can see behind me. Uh, I'm coming to you from Queens, which is the Canarsie and Muncie Lenape land. And I'm really thrilled to be here. Well, that's great. Hey, 
Uh, let's talk about you guys and your work just a little bit further. I'm going to start with Brooke and ask this question. You're both going to get it, though. Uh, how did each of you get into the field of intimacy? And let's start with Brooke. Great. Knowing you were going to ask this question, I said to oh, myself, yeah. keep it short, because I feel like I could talk for hours about what draw, drew me to this uh, field. And because in in general, it's a new field, when I look back, it's like so long of a trajectory uh, to get here. I think back to like when I was in undergrad, I was working for a theater company that went into, as an actor, that went into schools and did sexual abuse prevention. And we taught kids the difference between a good touch, a bad touch, and a confusing touch. Mm. And, and how to say no like you mean it. And I actually think that was one of the starts for me. I also remember in undergrad, uh, working on really tough material and wondering like, how do I do this material and then go to math class? And over time, before I even knew what an intimacy director was, but I was teaching at Marymount Manhattan College, I was working with students and alumni to create a warm down practice, which is exactly to bring you out of tough material. And now as intimacy choreographers, we would call that closure. Uh, so when I think about intimacy as boundaries and consent, choreography, closure, all within the context of the story we're trying to tell. I see like the boundaries and consent going back to probably that far and closure being probably my second foray into it. Um, yeah, I think that's the short version of what brought me here. <laughs> Very succinct, thank you. <laughs> uh, Cha, same question. How did you get involved with intimacy? Yeah. Um, so similar to Brooke, it's like, it's sort of been around for so long. I mean, I grew up in a Latine household where partner dance was a part of my life and how you, how two partners communicate non-verbally and, you know, communicate consent and communicate boundaries. has been a part of my life since I was a child. Um, but I think the specific field of intimacy, I really got in through fight direction. Um, you know, when sort of classes started to be, be offered in this discipline at all, a lot of them started at stage combat workshops. Um, you know, whether it was Alicia Rodas or Siobhan Richardson, like someone who was starting to call this stuff intimacy direction, um, they were offering classes at these stage combat workshops early on. Um, and I was in those rooms, you know, hungry for it because of my background of thinking about these things as a dancer and then as a theater maker and so on. So, you know, I've been kind of training in the discipline probably since it has had a name. Um, but I think Brooke has a really good point, right? That even before it had a name, the practices of thinking about consent and boundaries and putting choreography to this kind of movement, right? I was staging kisses as a fight director before I knew that was a thing. So yeah, like both organic and in classrooms is kind of where I where I found it. Uh, Cha, what is the role of an intimacy director once they're in the room? Yeah, so we've talked about it a little bit just in terms of how we have both came, right, to this practice. I see it as being a couple of different sort of branches of a tree. Um, so one is around establishing a space that, that honors and celebrates consent, right, and that knows what that means and that establishes a space where it's possible. Um, there's a lot that goes into that. Uh, but that's that's kind of like a big part of it is creating this sort of healthy workplace uh, mm -hmm. to be able to consent to mm -hmm. actions. The second part of it is advocacy, right? Is is sort of creating space so that performers and other creatives in the room can speak for themselves, right? Because a lot of times advocacy we think of as speaking for a person or a group, but I actually yeah. think about it as creating space for them to speak for themselves. Um, and then the last piece in the way I see it is choreography, right? Is thinking about physical storytelling in a very specific but also exciting way so that we don't default 
to any physical actions that mean a certain kind of intimacy, but instead we collaborate within the boundaries of the actors and the story all the creatives are trying to tell to make a specific, repeatable, physical story through choreography. So that's kind of the my sort of three-pronged way of going about it, but I'm I'm curious to see how Brooke sees it too. Go ahead, Brooke. Uh, I actually think you did a great job of describing it. I think it's, it is that kind of three-pronged way. I love what you said about um, facilitating, facilitating a space where advocacy is possible. Because I think the other thing is that everyone is responsible for the safety in the room. And that is one of the like most common things I feel, I find myself talking about is like, I'm not here to keep the space safe. I'm here to help you build a space that is safe for brave action, where actors can be uncomfortable as their characters, but it's actually all of our jobs to keep it safe. Mm -hmm. So part of it is, is, yeah, creating a space where people have the agency to advocate for themselves. And then, yeah, the fun part is the choreography. It's the storytelling. It's, you know, it's kind of like the being the dramaturg of the moments of touch or the moments of other kinds of intimacy, whatever they may be. It's, I find it a really fun role to look at a story through a very particular lens of intimacy and be like, my job is to make sure that we're telling that part of the story well. And um, it feels like a really wonderful place to be in the collaboration. Uh, and then, yeah, the third part for me, which I mentioned before, really is about closure is depending on the work is giving space and time so that actors have the opportunity to let go of a role and then go healthily about their lives. When do theaters need to hire an intimacy director, Brooke? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I think there's two answers, like when does the project need it? And when in the process do you make that decision? Uh, I'm gonna answer the second one first when in the process, as early as possible, and or as soon as you realize it. Um, the earlier the better, because we can prevent, help prevent a lot of um, missteps or potential hurt from happening if we're involved from the beginning. For example, if a show involves nudity, let's put that in the casting call. That seems like at this point, mostly a given, and yet, there are a lot of things in a production that you might want to give actors the opportunity to opt into rather than casting an actor and having to negotiate it later. So when to me is as soon as possible, like get me in at your production meeting, then we're like feeling really good. Um, and then when, as in like, when do you need one? I think that really depends on the project. Uh, certainly if there is nudity or, uh, simulated sex happening, then I think an intimacy choreographer is necessary. However, I've been brought in for much, much milder versions of physical intimacy. Um, I am have been brought in just as a queer consultant before. I think you can also look at like, what are the different forms of intimacy? Uh, like what's the context? And there are other things that could be could be necessary to bring in a specialist. Um, maybe I'll toss it to you there, Cha. Yeah, I think that that last piece, I kind of want to just like uplift and mm -hmm. echo, which is, you know, I think the cool thing about intimacy direction as a field is that it is young and it is broad already. So people have such interesting cross sections of expertise. And so you might find an intimacy director who's also a doula and knows a lot about childbirth. So if you're staging a childbirth scene, that's your person to go to. Um, but if you hired me as your intimacy director, I know very little about childbirth. So you also might wanna hire a cultural consultant who has some understanding of how that works, right? Or I might lead you to that intimacy director who has that cross competency. So it's it's like important, I think, when you're thinking about what do you need for a production, right? Is really, if it is a scripted piece, like really look at that script top to bottom and just think about those needs. Like think about 
what's in this? Is there violence? Think about a fight director. Is there intimacy? And intimacy, like Brooke said, might mean, you know, I did intimacy for a production that was about like family dynamics, right? Is how does this family, do they kiss hello? Do they hug hello? Which members of the family do and do not touch and why? You know, there's lots of ways that intimacy could be defined. Um, but the same way that you would look at a script and be like, oh, we have music, we need a musical director, right? It's just really getting into the weeds of what the pieces that you're trying to make. And I always say, if you're on the fence, reach out, right? I think if you think like, could this be served by an intimacy professional? Find an intimacy, intimacy professional in your area, reach out to a theater company that's used someone before, and ask, right? Like set up a call, send an email. It's always better to err on the side of maybe this would benefit my production and my team than to not go with it or to, to gloss over it. Hmm. Okay, that actually leads me uh, leads us into our next question, uh, which is what is the uh, what's the intersection between intimacy and violence? Uh, you had mentioned earlier, uh, Shaw, that you had. Uh, your first kiss scene, or your first fight scene, involved kissing. That's uh, that seems like two different uh, two different talents right there. So uh, t tell us more. How do you how does an intimacy director handle that? Yeah. So I think it's uh, it's exactly what you just said, which is they are two skill sets. I think there are a lot of intimacy directors like myself who came out of the stage combat fight direction community. So you might find someone who has those two skill sets. And especially, you know, again, it's about looking at the work that you're trying to make. But if you do have a piece that has violent intimacy or intimate violence, I, I use those things differently because they have different connotations. Um, Can you describe the two differences real quick? Yeah, so I think about violent intimacy as like intimacy that has a roughness to it, right? Mm. I think of intimate violence as violence between two intimate people, whether that's a domestic violence scene or, you know, parent to child or whatever that may be. So mm. it's sort of which one is the moment based in? Is it based in the intimacy or is it based in the violence? But the reason I use both is because the skill set is different, right? So knowing how to do moments of violence or actions of violence safely and kind of the really the sleight of hand that's involved in physical violence for the stage is its own technique and the sort of considerations around intimacy which i do think the fight community has learned a lot from and can continue to learn a lot from in terms of boundaries and consent and is its own technique and its own practice. And so there have been times where I've been called on to be both and they are two jobs. So I ask for two fees. Um, that's important for everyone to know. Yep. You're asking yep. someone on your team to do two jobs. Like yeah, you're hiring that. someone for a job. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but there are other times where I have said outright, like, I don't think I can do both these jobs, whether that's because the type of intimacy is not my specialization or the type of violence is not my specialization or if it's such a big thing that I think two people focused on their techniques is gonna be more helpful. And also cause sometimes just the collaboration is great, right? To be allowed to have only my intimacy hat on or only my fight direction hat on and then work with someone who has the other hat on is really joyful. Um, but it's, I think the, the baseline is remembering that it is two skill sets and that you might find a professional who has both and you absolutely can talk to them about hiring them for both, but they are separate. And I'm, I'm curious to hear from Brooke, 
to because we've worked together in that capacity. I I oh my gosh. So I promised myself that I wouldn't bring it up, but I'm sitting here just brimming. Um, yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and say that uh, Cha and uh, Brooke have worked together on a production directed by a brilliant young man, very distinguished. It's not about him though. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, on a production of Danny and the Deep Blue Sea, and it, it actually touches on this question. Uh, Brooke was uh, brought in specifically to Intimacy Direct, while Cha not only acted, but also wearing many hats as she always does, but also did the fight choreography as well. Uh, Brooke, you don't have to talk about that. I just did. Uh, but, but you could definitely tell us more about the intersection between violence and intimacy. Sure. Well, I think what worked so well for that, um, I will talk about it a little, was, and Shaw, you can certainly uh, disagree with me about this, but I think it made sense for Cha to be an actor and a fight director because it was about that sleight of hand, that physical safety, whereas asking an actor to be the intimacy professional in the room is actually a really tricky thing to ask because that actor should be allowed to be checking in with their own boundaries and absolutely respecting their scene partners, but they shouldn't be asked to create the space for the whole room. Um, so I think that's why even though Cha had all three skills, it was important to bring in someone else. Um, and I am not a fight designer or fight director at all. Um, I love to fight, I fight a lot, but when I am uh, intimacy directing a show that requires combat, I always ask for someone who is trained to do that choreography because it is then about the physical safety. Um, so I think those things are important. And I think it goes back to what we were talking about a question or two ago about different specialties. I'm thinking as we were talking about this, like it also would be different if it is a a scene of intimacy between, for example, a black man and a white woman, then we might also need someone with a specialty around race because that's a very different story. If there's violence and intimacy in that story, that's very different than a story between Cha and myself that is violent and physical. So I think, yeah, there's some there are specialties and one of the great things is when you interview for your project, finding out what a particular choreographer's specialties are and if they are actually the person, the person best suited to your project. Um, you mentioned boundaries when we were talking about uh, Cha and that work, those boundaries. Uh, some of our questions are actually uh, from anonymous contributors uh, and it actually leads directly into the first one that I'd like to ask. And I'm going to ask you, Brooks. I'm very glad that you brought this up, but uh, I'm going to read this. Excuse me. But it says, hello, Brooke and Christina. I identify as male, and while working on intimate scenes in rehearsal, I often feel afraid to explore as I would with an intimate partner in my personal life. Uh, I worry my scene partner might not feel comfortable or might possibly feel victimized. How does intimacy, how does intimacy direction deal with these concerns? That is such a great question. I'm so glad, uh, I'm so glad you asked it, anonymous contributor. Uh, <laughs> it's such an important one. Uh, and I think it also applies to some male directors. I just had a meeting uh, yesterday about a, a film where the director is male and the scene is going to be intimacy between two women and he said almost the exact same thing like I am nervous to stage it myself because I don't want to seem like I'm you know pervy you know those were his words and I think there's something that's really important in this where we need to realize that in a production everyone is an actor doing their job and so that's absolutely the job of an intimacy choreographer to help curate that space where we are very clear what the boundaries are, that consent is affirmative and enthusiastic so that everyone involved knows how to play, can be brave and play and isn't worrying about how they come off, isn't worrying about their scene partner. They are just worrying about telling the story and following their character's needs. And I think for men especially, that can be a really sensitive subject. And they really wanna make sure that they're doing it. And if they're given a space where it's like, okay, we're all gonna 
um, look, you can touch me here, you can touch me here, front of chest is off limits, I don't want anything going in my mouth. You know, like if I give you really clear uh, ideas of what is okay, then you know where you can play. And I think, I think that's the key, which is why, and I'm evangelical about this, it is important to, to know your boundaries and to work on that as an actor on your own time. So when you come into a rehearsal and someone says like, okay, we're gonna talk about boundaries, you aren't someone who just says, I'm good with anything. Because that actually doesn't help your scene partner. I am rarely trust that that is true. So doing your own work and figuring out what are my boundaries? Boundaries are such a gift because they give your scene partner like the paint and the brushes to be able to make the art. Without the boundaries, it's like, ah, uh, what do I do? Giant blank canvas. So yeah, I think I'm so grateful for that question. I don't know, Chad, do you, what do you have to add? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you said so much. I, I think that the, the biggest thing that I wanna uplift is that everyone in the room is allowed to have boundaries, right? Everyone in the room is a full member of that team. Right. And so I think what happens a lot, and it's not only, you know, because I've also seen the trend of it being a gender based thing that that a lot of men in the room might feel uncomfortable or feel like they're not allowed to have boundaries or feel like they have to, you know, sort of acquiesce to a female scene partner if like if she's OK with it, then I am. Um but they might not be, right? He might not be. And also it's not always about gender either. I've, I've found, I've seen it a lot in terms of um, the instigator of an action, right? That often we think about whoever is receiving an action as being the potential victim or the person who might get hurt. But the instigator of an action, even if it's a consensual story, even if it's a beautiful love story, right? The instigator of an action is often the one who needs a little more care and a little more reminding that they are welcome to also have boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. That just because your scene partner says this is okay, doesn't mean it's okay for you. You might not be okay and that's okay, right? Um, so to me, you know, when I, Brooke was saying like, you know, when an actor says, oh, anything is fine that I rarely trust it. Like that's the actor who I will approach separately and say, what do you need? What support do you need to feel like you can discover what your boundaries are so that you can share them with us, right? Because it, it comes from a place of generosity. I think it also comes from a place of self-awareness, right? I think the men who are thinking that way, the actors of any gender who are thinking that way are thinking that way because they don't want to do harm, right? They're thinking that way out of genuine care for the space and an understanding that they have privilege in a male body, right? And that's great. That acknowledgement is great. And also that's the conversation that I would have with that actor is what support do you need to be able to come into the space ready to work? Because it can also put a lot of undue pressure on your scene partner. If you're like, I have no boundaries, it's whatever you need. Mm. then that person might actually feel like they have to take care of this actor <laughs> in some kind of weird backwards way, you know? So that's that's my like strategy for that is just making sure that everyone in the room feels supported to come with their full selves. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm going to, guys, just to kind of take us into what's going on in the world right now. Uh, we feel like you can't get away from it. We do live in unprecedented times and we are living like smack dab in the middle. Uh, well, I'm assuming middle or end or who knows with COVID, and, but we have been dealing with it for months now. And we'd really like to know how has that affected your work? Uh, Cha, since you just finished talking, how about you start us off with this conversation too? Yeah, sure. You know, it's, and this is something that Brooke and I, you know, not only are we colleagues, we're dear friends, we stay in touch regularly <laughs> to just be like, how are you handling? How is it going? Um, and I think one of the things that 
you know, I don't want to obviously speak for you, Brooke, but I think one of the things that in our conversations has been very obvious to me is that there's two things happening. One is how does intimacy work digitally, virtually, because that has been so much of theater. And, and I don't want to diminish that work because that work has been life-saving for a lot of artists and a lot of audiences and also has innovated in really cool and exciting ways that I don't think are going anywhere. Um, but then the other side of the question is, and how are we thinking about intimacy as we re-enter rehearsal spaces? So I think in terms of sort of the virtual intimacy, there have been such interesting questions of like, what does it mean to invite an audience into my literal home, right? What does it mean to do a scene in my actual bathroom, not a set bathroom, right? What is the consent around my space as well as my physical body. And then like physical storytelling, how do we tell the story of touch across a screen? Um, and then in terms of coming into spaces together, you know, I actually think COVID has given us as a society, a lot of gifts around consent. I, I see more and more people asking if it's okay to hug, asking if it's okay to have masks off if we're vaccinated. Ask, right, like checking in with people in really authentic ways and also checking in with people about emotional boundaries, right? Is like, you know, FYI, if you can't respond to this email for a couple of days, that's okay, right? Like just the way that we have cared for each other in this time, I think is important. And I think is hugely important as we come back into spaces together and we are reestablishing boundaries as performers because something that might have been okay before and a performer might say, yeah, I'm totally fine with kissing. Now, in this time, in this place, for the first time in over a year, that same actor might not be okay with kissing and they might not realize it until they're in the room, right? Boundaries can be discovered in the moment. And sometimes boundaries are discovered because they're crossed, right? An actor doesn't know they have a boundary, it gets crossed and then it's like, oh no, and so the facilitating of spaces that Brooke and I were talking about earlier is just sort of like tenfold right now to make sure that, that we continue to care for each other and that we continue to hold what we need to around how our boundaries can change and how consent can change. And also how information can change. It's like you were saying, Colin, you know, we're now in this moment where we don't know whether we're in the middle or at the end or, and so lots of things can change both within the individual performer and in the world at large. And like just being ready and flexible and communicating. Um, I think as an intimacy director, that's a lot of what I'm bringing into spaces right now. Um, but yeah, I'm curious, Brooke, how, what it's been like for you, what it, continues to be like? I think the things you said are so just right on from my experience. The two things that I was thinking about while you were talking were one, as we re-enter, that uh, allowing for time is a really valuable thing. Um, I love what you said about sometimes we don't know, um, we even have a boundary until it's been crossed. And I am finding for myself that I've had moments of like total social awkwardness as I am like for the first time in a space with more than just my partner and another person, you know, like, and the words are like time, we can give each other time and grace. And that might mean shorter rehearsal times. Um, it might be in longer or more frequent breaks. Uh, particularly if people are coming back into the rehearsal room for the first time. I remember my first time back in a rehearsal room was with Company of Fools on gruesome playground injuries. And I was so thrilled to be there. I cried a few happy tears. And by the end of the first rehearsal, I was so tired I went home and took a nap. Oh. And like, it's just a lot for us to learn, relearn how to be together. Um, and then the other thing I just want to say about this is so much of it has felt limiting and some of it has felt expansive, um, both in what Cha was saying about people being more thoughtful about uh, asking for consent and also 
the ways in which we have adapted to use online ways to be present. I know uh, Cha and I have both intimacy directed things on that, that were on Zoom. Uh, I have worked on uh, films where I am in New York and the film is being shot in other places in the country. There, there has been an expansiveness. These kinds of Q and A's, I think all three of us happen to be in New York, but I have done Q and A's where people were all over the world and there has been a, a kind of expansive community that we have discovered in this time that has been a positive. Oh. Um, Brooke, okay. I've been saving this question because I'm not certain if I'm asking it correctly. So both of you can take this question as you take it. Uh, what does bad intimacy direction look like? How? What are the earmarks of bad intimacy? Uh, how have you seen it gone awry? And I'm also, before, uh, you guys are very good at passing it back and forth. So before I go any further, on the flip side, uh, what are the signs of health and healthy intimacy direction? Uh, can you, Brooke, start start us off with that? Yeah, great. That's such a good question, and I feel like that could be a whole conversation. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, like I'm like, well, on one hand, bad is like if boundaries are being crossed and we're not taking care of each other. But I think what I want to answer it from is the storytelling perspective. I think if it's not done well, and I'm going to go back to a few questions ago. Um, what we don't want is it to come down to the actor's experience in the room and have the actor that's the most comfortable with intimacy being the one that's always initiating because that doesn't necessarily tell the story we're trying to tell. And I think before we were so thoughtful about this, that's often what happened. I know there have been plenty of times when I as an actor have been the person doing a lot of the initiating um, when I was much like much younger. And I think it was because I felt more comfortable with staged intimacy, not because my character would have been. And I remember times being really frustrated where it's like, you're supposed to, you're supposed to like, go, go ahead, I'm ready. Um, so I think that's actually storytelling wise, bad intimacy is if we haven't set up what the boundaries are and the actors aren't really ready to attack it as their characters. Um, Attack might be the right word. Attack might be the wrong word, depending on what kind of intimacy it is. But right. yeah, I think I think for me that's what it is, is when when we aren't when whatever's going on around boundaries and consent doesn't allow the story to be the focus. We've got to be able to get past it and really just tell a great story. Yeah, I wanna I want to dive in there because I'm also, you know, as you heard in my bio, I'm also a dramaturg, right? And so when I think about how often I have seen muddy intimacy, right? And we see it with all kinds of storytelling in the theater, in novels, in movies, where you're just like, whether or not it's intimacy, right? Just that the story is muddy because something wasn't thought through or something, and you can see it and you feel it. And and I think that that's like Brooke is saying is that having an intimacy professional in the room who knows what they're doing and who is excited to work with what you're working with and who has the competences you need for the story you're telling, like what they can offer you is specificity in that storytelling is making it exactly what you need it to be so that there is no muddiness on the part of the audience and it's happening within the boundaries of the actors. So I think exactly that combination. So I, I think it can go wrong, like Brooke said, where whether it's the story is muddy and we don't really know what we're seeing and we don't really believe that this character would do this or whatever, or when an actor's boundaries are not actually taken into account, right? And I think that that can happen for a lot of reasons. I think that can happen um, sometimes with overconfidence, right? Um, with someone saying like, oh, I can totally stage the intimacy and then realizing they might not have the tools when push comes to shove, which I also wanna bring back to Brooke's like brilliant answer earlier about the when to bring in an intimacy director. 
that like, yes, ASAP, but that might mean when you realize it. And it's okay to realize it if like, you know, you out there watching this are a director or a dance choreographer or whatever you may be, and you might think, oh, I can stage this. And then you get into the room and realize that you might not be able to be the best person to stage that moment. It's also okay to call then, right? It's, it's okay to have that moment of self-awareness and say, I need someone who has more expertise here. Um, so that's another time that I've seen it both go muddy in the storytelling or also, you know, an actor like, because you hear it when you're working, I don't know about you, Brooke, but when you're working as an intimacy director, the amount of times that I've heard an actor say, gosh, I wish I had had a you when I did this project or that project. And, it, and it's, it's tough. It's tough to hear. Um, and I do think a lot of times it's not nefarious. It's just an a ignorance of how to invite the actors into agency and self-advocacy um, that, that I hope and believe that as an industry, we are sort of on our way towards a better dynamic and a better paradigm. Um, yeah, that's what I would add. Mm. So in terms of creating that better paradigm, a safer space, um, does an intimacy director's responsible, responsibility extend to beyond the rehearsal room to company members and also maybe to audience members in some way, shape or form? Uh, we heard stories about uh, moments of intimacy being captured on camera and brought, you know, put on the internet and stuff. Uh, where does, how does an intimacy director deal with that? Uh, where are their boundaries when it comes to outside of the rehearsal hall? Uh, yeah. Cha, start with us, please. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I, I think, you know, Brooke said something earlier too that 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 is pertinent to this. Um, which is this idea that it is everyone's responsibility in the room, right, to create a consent forward, healthful workspace. And that includes inviting the audience into a consent forward space, which might be something as simple as a content warning um, in terms of allowing the audience to consent to being in the space. But when you talk about stuff like the audience stepping over the actor's boundaries, right, I think a lot about how if you do bring in someone who has the expertise of intimacy direction or of consent practice early in your process so that you can do things like add nudity to your casting call, you might also start to do things like have trainings for your ushers around what to do in those situations. You might have, right, which is not necessarily the purview of the intimacy director or their responsibility, but having someone who's at the production meetings who's thinking about all the parts that make a consent forward space, or even something I talk about, you know, in the rehearsal room is I am very adamant that stage managers also have an option to not be in the room should they not want to witness a scene being staged. And what that means is having a team of stage managers, right? Making sure that you have you know, an SM and an ASM, maybe two ASMs, right? So that there is someone who can be in the space for the safety of the actors, but that if you happen to have a stage manager who is not comfortable witnessing that scene, they don't have to. Or letting your stage hands know that there is a scene, right? The content warning need not only be for the audience, it's also for your employees and for your staff. And so I think just having someone on the team who's talking about consent can just make a producer's mind like ding or a company manager's mind ding to say, ooh, have we thought about this? And so like, those are the moments that I sort of live for because it is the moment of, oh yeah, we're all, we're all responsible for this. We all can make things better. Um, and so the kind of like short answer is, no, I don't think it's the responsibility of the intimacy director to either protect the audience or protect the actors from the audience, but it can be, that work can be inspired by the work of an intimacy director or by intimacy practices at large. I don't know, Brooke, it, it, you know, 
if you have to add to that. I don't have very much to add, honestly. I thought you did a great job. The, I, the, the small thing I will add is when you're thinking about hiring an intimacy choreographer, looking at your budget and deciding what, which things you are wanting and able to hire them for. Because sometimes I'm brought in for one day to put eyes on a particular moment. Sometimes I'm with the whole production, uh, but I don't assume that I am responsible for the content warning and the training of the ushers and writing of the casting call, unless I'm hired to do all of those things. So mm -hmm. that's part of, part of why, one, talking about it early, and two, recognizing that this is a budget line and figuring out what is important to your company and, and how do you show that in your budget? And then how do you hire appropriately for it? That's a great, that's actually a really good segue to my next question. So what can actors, directors, theaters do to better prepare for scenes of intimacy? Uh, just in general, what, what would you say, Brooke? I think it breaks down into actors, directors, theater producers, like actors, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but please take some time on your own to be checking in with your own boundaries, knowing that your no is a gift. Uh, I know Cha teaches a class about four actors that is outside of any kind of production where actors can tune into their boundaries. The other thing is take choreography classes, and I don't even mean intimacy choreography classes, because intimacy choreography is repeatable, recordable movement. You have to have discipline of your body. You have to be able to know that there's a difference between a three second and a five second kiss and able to do it over and over again with discipline and consistency. So the more you can train your body to be a great instrument, the more prepared you're gonna be. Uh, directors, I think directors can take classes on consent. Not, you don't have to be an act, uh, intimacy choreographer to create a consent forward space. And there are plenty of classes on just like learning a boundary setting practice. I think there are a lot of projects that could use a consent forward room that don't necessarily need an intimacy choreographer. So I think every director should take at least a class on boundaries and consent. Uh, I think that would be amazing. And then theaters or producers, the short answer I would say is budget for it. And think about it early. And if you don't have the budget for it, do a different show. Like when you're looking at planning your season, look at what you can do safely and ethically. And an intimacy choreographer should not be your afterthought. Um, I agree with Cha. Sometimes you're like at the last minute, oh no, what do I do? But it's a, it is a specialized skill and there are many people that are highly trained and ready to help. And, uh, and you need that space in your budget. So I think that's a really important thing is when you're looking at your season, just in the way that you would look at, do I need a fight director? Do I need a lighting set designer? Do I need an intimacy choreographer? And how much of the process do I want them for? And how can I pay them for that? Yeah, I'd only add to that, because um, that was very thorough. Uh, the only thing I'd add to that is also, I was gonna say this is just for directors and producers, but I think it's for actors as well. Um, I'd really recommend doing some independent study on power dynamics. Um, I think something that I've realized more and more in this work is that with, I've noticed it with producers especially, that when a producer knows how much power they have in the space, they can use it for good and they can use it to really top down, create a totally different paradigm for how work happens in our industry. And I I think I, the more I understand power dynamics and the more I understand how they can be used for ill, the more I recognize how they can be used for good and how they can make real change. And also, so that's why I was thinking like directors, producers, leaders in the space, but also actors recognizing how power dynamics might affect your ability to consent in a given space, not only actor to director, that dynamic, but also gender, race, all other cross sections of identity, like having a little bit of self-study on that can be huge to knowing how to advocate for yourself. Um, so that that's the only thing I would add is is some study, real study in power dynamics. Okay. Speaking of study, 
Um, where can people learn more about the field? Uh, practice intimacy. Are there certifications? Is there training? Where do people go, Chum? Yeah. So, you know, there's so many things. Um, there's absolutely a variety of organizations that teach intimacy direction. The ones you're going to hear most often about are probably theatrical intimacy education, intimacy directors and coordinators, intimacy coordinators of color, um, Heartland Intimacy. There are more. Um, there are also, if there's an independent or individual intimacy director that you really jive with and align with, reach out to them, talk to them about shadowing them, talk to them, right? It doesn't need to be through an organization to be legitimate. And I think my big kind of philosophical thing about seeking training in this work is to recognize that, yes, some of these organizations offer certifications, some don't. I think as someone with an MFA, I often use this analogy that a certification is like an MFA. You do not need an MFA to be a director. But if you feel like an MFA is your best path to learn more about directing, go for it. So I think similarly, having certification does not is not the way that you are a legitimate intimacy director or a qualified intimacy director. But if you feel like a specific organization's pedagogy or tools of teaching you is the right way to go, go for it. Um, mm -hmm. But I, you know, it's as legitimate to find someone who you've worked with or you've heard of or you've seen on a panel and be like, hey, can I learn from you? What are you doing? How can I learn more? So that would be my advice for folks wanting to do more. Yeah. Okay. Brooke? I totally agree uh, with everything Cha has said and want to kind of echo the the part about there being a diversity of training currently, um, Chelsea Pace, who's theatrical intimacy education, one of the founders and wrote the book, Staging Sex, also wrote an article recently about the importance of diversity of study, that the industry is so new, it's important for lots of people to be researching and doing the work and then collaborating together. And that like, that's good. We're gonna pull great things out of each other. And I know that's been true. I know when I said like how I came to the work, I talked, I didn't talk about study at all, but I've studied with several different organizations, even after I did the work up into including this summer, and I will continue to do so because there are other really terrific people who are like ear to the ground and they've got an idea and they're cultivating that idea. And I wanna learn from everyone. And I think uh, diversity of approach is so important right now while the industry is kind of in its toddlerness. I was gonna say infancy, but I would say maybe toddlerness. <laughs> okay. um, that, uh, yeah, if you find one organization that you're like, this is it for me, this is feeding my soul, then yes, focus. And before that, try a lot of of, of other people and, and learn from everyone. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, before I let you go, um, uh, is, is there, let's see, how can we contact you? If someone else wants to get out there and find out more information about you, uh, Brooke, how can they get involved with what you're doing? Oh, great. Uh, well, my Instagram handle is at Brooke M. Haney. Uh, and my website is brookemhaney.com. And I actually have under intimacy, I have a list of resources that um, a few different things that you can click on if you're interested in learning a little bit more. There's a few things there. I think there's actually currently a different panel that Cha and I sat on. on uh. my but there's also like a link to a directory of queer intimacy choreographers because while that's a thing I do, I might not be exactly right for your project. And so uh, someone put together a directory and that's there as well. So it's a great place to get, to find people to work with. Cha, how can we contact you? Well, first, let me just say that I want to go to Brooke's website and learn some things from that. Yeah, me too. That's awesome that you offer that. Um, so I can also be found on the great Instagram, uh, at Cha of All Trades, one word. Um, and my website is www.callmecha.com. Um, and that's, you know, contact me through that website. I do respond, even if it takes me a little while. Um, and you can see more on my website about all the different things that I do. 
um, there's like a little page for each kind of discipline that I engage in in the theater. So yeah, please reach out. Would love to hear from y'all. Brooke, Chomp, thank you so, so much. Um, as we close out, first off, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, I am the managing director of a company called Company of Fools. If you'd like to get in touch with us for any reason or see what we're doing in the future or see what we've done in the past with Brooke and with Cha, uh, then you go to companyoffoolstheater.com. Theater is spelled R-E, not E-R. Um, you can also follow us on Facebook. And we have an Instagram right here on my phone. I'm reading this off my phone. Very professional. Um, let's see. Fools at Fools Co. At Fools Co. And of course, uh, I would like to thank TDF for supporting our conversation. Again, to find out more information about them, visit www.tdf.org or follow them on social media at TDFNYC. So from Company of Fools, TDF, Brooke and Shaw here in NYC, thank you all for your time. Stay safe, stay creative. Goodbye, everyone.